What's going on, CNFers? Before we get started, I want to tease something. I have something I'd like to offer you, loyal listeners. And the thing is, I could say it now, but I think I'm going to hold off until the very end of the show. Is that mean? It's kind of mean, isn't it? Sorry about that. No, I'm not. This week, I welcome Chris Arvidsson for episode 75 of the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, the show where I speak with the world's best artists about creating works of nonfiction, leaders in narrative journalism, radio, essay, memoir, and documentary film, and try to tease out their stories, habits, and routines so you can improve your own creative practice. Chris co-edited, along with Diana Nelson-Jones, The Love of Baseball, Essays by Lifelong Fans, published by McFarland. It's a beautiful book, and we talk about its genesis, what makes for good baseball writing versus horrible baseball writing, what's the most important thing for Chris when developing a story, the organic nature of building a network, favorite books on writing, and much, much more. Chris also edited the anthology's Reflections on the New River and Mountain Memoirs. You can find more about her work at chrisarvidson.com. You feel good? You ready to go? I'm done. Let's get to episode 75 with Chris Arvidson. Kind of get, get started here. Um, I kind of wanted to start, sometimes I start with the origin of people's lives, and um, I kind of want to pivot off of that, maybe get to that later, and actually get into... Um, sort of the real reason that we're even talking, which is the love of baseball. There's essays by lifelong fans and edited by you and uh, Diana Nelson-Jones. Yep. And uh, just let's talk about the origin of this. Like, How did you come to want to compile these types of essays uh, for for people who love baseball? And, you know, talk a little bit about just how you uh, how where the idea came from and how it came together. It, it was a really strange confluence of events. I worked on a book called uh, uh, about the new river for a publisher um, in my neighborhood, believe it or not. McFarland um, publishing is like five miles from my house, which if you understand where I live, which is in the middle of nowhere, it's kind of astounding So I had worked on this New River book, and um, I, you know, really hit it off with everybody over there and discovered, coincidentally, that they publish more baseball books than just about anybody in the country. It's one of their niche things. So, like, how crazy is that? Um, One of the editors actually saw my tiger flag on my house. And because I live right in the little town and they're like, wow, who the heck is that <laughs> um, that has a tiger flag in uh, Mountain Town in North Carolina? So so they they talked to me about a base, a baseball book as, you know, yet undetermined. And, um, and it occurred to me that I might follow up that river anthology with the baseball anthology and I immediately thought of. Diana Nelson Jones, who was an old baseball buddy of mine from when I lived in Pittsburgh. And um, she has written for the Post Gazette there for like 25 plus years. Wow. So she's avoided uh, to date like any of those, any massive newspaper cuts that seem to happen to long tenured reporters. Exactly. So, you know, and she's really written just about everything for them. The way we met was I was living in Pittsburgh. She was writing sports and she wrote a column about Jason Kendall, the Pirates catcher, who was my favorite player there at the time. And I sent her a fan mail, a fan email about it because I thought it was so great. And um, we ended up being baseball buddies. Um, And that's been some time ago. I mean, we had. We uh, just have always stayed in touch. Hmm. It's that baseball connection. Yeah, there's there's something to be said. Like I love catchers. I love catching. Um, they're they're a breed unto themselves on the diamond. And uh, there's something to be said for the the slight uh, scrappy catcher. That's not necessarily like Pudge or Carlton Fisk. 
And yeah. You're talking about like Jason Kendall, like Craig Biggio before he moved over to second base. You know these five foot eight, five foot nine guys who who are leaders and have a undeniable cannon for an arm. But they, you would not I don't know, looking at looking at a lineup of players, you would say like, oh, they're definitely not a catcher. They're more like a middle infielder. And uh, right. What was it about uh, Jason Kendall that that well, it, that you like? You know, it was definitely that scrappy, that scrappy kind of throwback guy, meaning you know, kind of grubby. You expect him to be dirty, you know, scrapper. It's the scrapper thing, definitely. So, what were the what was logistically? All right, so you've been green greenlit to get this collection together. How did you go about? starting to uh, create a stable of writers and then start to uh, feel out how you were going to fill the pages? Well, it, it was really, it, it was interesting how easy it was. It, it was easier for this than the other anthologies I've done that were more uh, geographically specific. Um, Diana and I had um, a, a couple of days of skull sessions, you know, where we sat down and just started writing about topics that we'd like to see and people that we knew that had stories or connections to baseball. And, you know, we just, there was just a ton, there was a ton of them. And some of them were people who were, um, you know, very competent writers that we knew or, um, you know, colleagues, Diana had, of course, had colleagues at the paper. But when we put that whole list together, it was a pretty damn big list. And so we said, all right, this we're going to ask everybody on our wish list first and see how we, how it shakes out, see where we need to go from there. We had one person who felt like they couldn't just they didn't have the time to fit it in one mm-hmm. out of all the people that we asked. <laughs> and, then, and then we started looking at what, you know, some people we asked specifically because we knew they had a point of view or a story. And some people, we asked them to pitch us what they'd like to do, knowing that they had several things and, you know, that that could pop up. And then we looked at where we saw there might be holes. And that's kind of where, and that's where the second phase kicked in. And that was me putting out a call to um, other Goucher gophers. And that was super successful. There are seven Goucher folks in the book. And they all, including you, have very unique stories to tell. So that was that was like a big bonus, big bonus. Yeah, we, were, we came out of the bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was just, it was fabulous cuz the range of stories was just so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh so what was the experience like as you were starting to read through these stories then? Like what was that to get a perspective of these oh, I I don't know how many people are in here. Let's say there's roughly 25 to 30. Uh, there's 30. Yeah. 30, 30 if you count Diana and myself. Yeah. yeah so 30 30 <laughs> essays, 30 points of view uh ex- all under the umbrella of baseball. But what, so what was that like, you know, reading this stuff and seeing all this stuff come in? Like it, what degree, what was that experience like for you? Um, we, we, uh, we read them first, you know, individually, Diana read a, a group of them and I read a group of them. And I honestly, I was really blown away. There were, there wasn't anything that got, you know, that we had to say, Oh, this is just not good enough or this is not interesting enough or it's just not going to fit. We didn't, we did not have that experience. We had a few people and they were among the less experienced writers for the most part who we had to kind of drag across the finish line because <laughs> uh, they had really good stories to tell, but they were having trouble getting their butt in the seat as it were. <laughs> I had I had one really good friend who is an experienced writer who whose story and I'll just tell you which one it was because she won't care. It was the um, Julie Townsend story about the minor league ball player who lives in my area, who's from my from where I live. And you know, and it was such a great story. 
I didn't, you know, we didn't want it to not be in there. It was the only one like it. And I just said, okay, just come over to my house tomorrow and bring all your notes and we're just going to do it. Nice. So that did. We just, we just sat down and I took all our notes and got out my computer and wrote the damn thing. <laughs> Put it all together, you know, cause she had some great interview notes and, you know, of course the, the title of that one, the title of that one was hilarious and it was a great quote right from the story about get a shower before somebody gets hurt. <laughs> In talking with uh, Glenn Stout, who um, he edits the Best American Sports Writing series, and uh, he um, he considers himself, you know, he's a brilliant ed- editor and he, he considers himself like a really good RBI guy. Which, mm-hmm. which is to say, like, he knows that is, you know, a lot of the writers he works has worked with and works with, you know, they're really good at getting the third base. And he's like, you know, I'm the guy I can get them home, you know, they yeah. get from third to home. And it looks like that you were the RBI guy to get yeah. Ju- Julie's piece across. Um, <laughs> Julie, yeah, she said, I think you should put your name on this, too. And I'm like, no, <laughs> this is, you know, this is a, it's a, it was a great, you know, it was a great little piece. And um, Martin. Little, the guy that she wrote about and interviewed, um, uh, is a really great guy who I knew. And I didn't know until she proposed writing this story that he had played minor league baseball. And I see the guy like five times a week. So, you know, it it turned out. And of course, and the other thing that was fun about that story is that Julie knows nothing about baseball. Mm. You know, there was a little bit of translation and explanation that had to go uh, with her on how to put it all together because she didn't have all the names right or, you know, know who they were or, you know, stuff like that. So it made it kind of interesting. So what uh, what do a lot of these essays have in common with each other besides Um, besides the obvious? But like, what did you notice? across all of them how do they how are they similar and how do they differ in a lot of ways almost everybody um started to form a connection to baseball as a very young person and um not necessarily playing because there's a lot of women in this book which i think you know and i've had people comment to me that 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 that's unexpected to them that people would find such a connection or, or be passionate about uh, a sport like baseball that they didn't really play much themselves. So it, it, it did start, it seems to have started young for everyone that's, that's in the book, you know, and it's, and it's a progression too. It's um, the pe- people's relationship with the game change over their life. That's a that's a big thing I've noticed uh, just with my evolution with it, because um, I can definitely say there was a big period of time when I I did not love baseball at all. I it was not fun for me anymore, and so it's uh, I I come from it at a at kind of at a different angle than some people. Like I I burned out on it big time. So there was a big chunk of my life where it was just I probably loved it up until I was about sixteen, and then went from like 16 to 21 in my prime athletic years, really not liking it. And uh, right. it, it took me another like 10 years to kind of come around to it and be able to go to games and watch games with uh, a degree of fun that I severely lacked since I was like a little kid, really. Right, right. Well, there is that, you know, that connection back to being a little kid is pretty, um, it's pretty obvious for everyone too, even if that's a melancholy kind of looking back. Right. What surprised you most? I mean, you said there were a lot of women had a strong connection to it who didn't necessarily play baseball itself. Uh, um, what, what else surprised you when you were Uh, getting these pieces? It's not just, um, you know, you expect that people will talk about, um, listening to or going to games with their dad and it's not all dads. There's some moms in there, too. Um, they do tend to be kind of my age, which is early 60s. Um, the moms, my age moms, frequently got people into baseball, not the dads. 
And of course, obviously, the women who do talk about playing or wanting to play and not being able to play um, are, you know, another younger generation than myself because that was never even a question. I mean, there was no little league or T-ball or anything. There was no title nine when I was that age. So yeah, yeah. we had dick basically. Um, but that doesn't, you know, that didn't stop anybody from, that didn't stop women from wanting to play or, or loving, learning to love the game. Baseball writing can sometimes devolve into, you know, too too saccharine and yeah and oh, yeah. and heavy heavily weighted in nostalgia and in a in a bad way that mm -hmm. the bad baseball writing can turn into that kind of like that field of dreamy wp kinsella way um yeah. and what about baseball writing when it when it's really singing and cracking really uh, resonates with you right it you know, yeah, I don't need to hear another story about how you went to the baseball game with your dad. It's like, you know, we, we had to be really, we had to be pretty careful with that part of it. And, and that's why we were really wanting to understand what people were going to go set about writing at the beginning. Um, when we first talked to them about being in the book, cause I didn't want to get 30 pieces about going to the ball game when you were eight with your dad. Cause you know, blah. But I would, but we both really wanted to ha have that feeling of experience of um, of how people experience baseball over their lifetime and what it feels like. So my if when I was trying to communicate that to other writers, I would frequently refer them to the passage in Diana's book about making that sign for. Uh, Roberto Clemente's birthday when she was a kid and taking it to the ballpark and about how he tipped his hat to her and she thought she was going to just fly off the stands. That was just like, wow, right? So tell me your story that's like that, that's about that, that's about what, what, what is your connection to that experience? Yeah, and uh, who are some uh, baseball writers that you still you turn to frequently because they just they know how to get the right the right tone right between that experience and they tow that nostalgia line you know without going over it and well I you know Boswell mm -hmm. uh, I love Boswell he's the guy that tells the story about it you know his dad worked for the Library of Congress. And um, he tells the story about his dad taking him to work with him. And because he's an actually a D.C. person, his dad takes him to the Library of Congress and he takes him into the stacks and he takes him to the section. And he says, OK, kid, here's every book that's ever been written about baseball. Don't go blind. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, how can you not be great after that? Um, I like George Will's baseball writing, too. You know, I don't have really much use for him otherwise, frankly, but yeah. I really like his baseball writing. Those, those would be the two that I, I think I like the most. Yeah, I'd throw Roger Angel into that list, too. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. If, do you, well, what do you think of him? Does he not resonate with you quite as much? Yeah, I don't know what it is about. You know, maybe maybe it's because um, maybe it's the DC thing that that um, you know with Boswell and Will that gets my attention because I when I lived there I was really involved in thinking about baseball on a day to day basis and it might be that connection. Yeah, yeah, because you were for a time in the early '80s, you were a season ticket holder with with a bunch right. of people for the Orioles. Yeah. Because we didn't have anything in D.C. Right. Yeah, Cal, Rip Cal to, Ripken was my favorite worked. player yeah. growing up. Oh, right. How could, you not, how could he not be? Yeah. Yeah, he was the Iron Man. I wore number eight through, uh, throughout my whole career because of him. <laughs> we, yeah, there's some great, you know, my, uh, my friend Glenn Marcus, who's got a story in here about the, that's a lot about the Orioles. Um, he doesn't say so specifically in his story, but. His connection is um, 
was is was his dad, but it was unique. His dad was the marketing guy for National Premium Beer, <laughs> which is like the beer of kind of like Stroh's used to be for the Tigers. So you know, his dad would he, he you know he could take him to games. He could go Glenn could go down on the field and play catch with the players and stuff. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. So what about? Uh- you know, you had that 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 unique editing experience, being the you know getting Julie's piece across the finish line, so to speak, uh, and writing writing your own pieces, uh, your own piece in here, and in, in general, uh, what part of the writing process appeals most to you, like editing or the writing? Well, you know, it it was interesting because I didn't write my piece until everybody else's was done, because I thought if, if there's a hole then I can fill it. And you know, sometimes um, doing a piece like this is, um, it's hard to think about what to do because you have so many stories you could tell. So, you know, I really went after the kind of the trying to feel like being there angle of it. And I really, so honestly, I, I enjoyed writing my piece as much as I enjoyed writing really anything I've done. I'm, I'm really proud of it. I think it turned out terrific. Um, but that's partly because I'd read everybody else's really great stuff before. <laughs> mm-hmm. I learned some things about my own writing by reading all those other ones first. It's almost like an unfair advantage. <laughs> so what, what about the uh, reading all the others? What did you what was the big takeaway that you got from the other pieces that you were you were able to deploy into your own? I think a lot of it was pace. It was in, you know, two to 3,000 words, how do you put together a context so that um, you can really buy into the story when you're reading it? You know, so how do you set up your story and then how do you make it move, move along? Those were the main things I think I got from others. And what about... Writing and writing true stories uh, appealed to you at a at a younger age that made you want to pick up the pen as sort of a vocation. Well, I, you know, I it never occurred to me honestly to to do anything else because it just seemed so much more interesting to me to because there were so many there's so much great real stuff happening. It seemed kind of dumb to make up anything. <laughs> right. It, it, I really didn't. Now later, I, and I finished up my um, Goucher program in 2005. So you know, it's been a while. And I will confess that um, I have actually dabbled in fiction and poetry since then. But that's not. It's never going to be my main thing to not. Does it, when you da- when you dabble with the fiction, does it? This sounds really stupid, but this is how I feel when I just noodle around with it. Does it feel too fake to you? Well, it, yeah, it feels kind of contrived, you know, and it feels like it. It, yeah. I mean, I and I have a novel in progress. That I've written like eighty thousand words that I started five years ago with the National Novel Writing Month, and I have a. I have a small writing group, and it's two other people who primarily have written nonfiction as well, and they are attempting this novel thing. Um, so that really functions as a thing that gets my butt in the seat, but I don't end up always doing fiction. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, there's another uh, Goucher person who has put together an anthology um, that's going to be coming out sometime in the next month or two. Cat Pleska. Oh yeah, I know Cat. Yeah, and and I actually wrote a poem for that. That's going to be in this um, anthology uh, with the theme of unity. So uh, that'll be a that'll be a real trip. <laughs> that I would have a published poem is pretty crazy yeah and what what has to be in place for you to really sink your teeth into an essay or a piece of a reported piece 
that gets you excited um, to want to keep going through the research? A deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's self-imposed, I have to have one. I really do. Now, I, I'm thinking about, um, and, and my baseball book publisher is interested in me doing this. So that's kind of a deadline of its own. I mean, if you actually have somebody that's interested in do, publishing something you haven't written yet, I think you need to pay attention, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> that I'm going to like really go off the farm and publish a book of essays about being in Jerusalem. Because I've been going there on an archaeological dig project the last for three summers, and I'm going to be going again this summer. And it's a pretty fascinating topic, and you know, I'm trying to think about how to get my head around that right now. But that's kind of a deadline. I mean, I'm going this summer. They're interested in it now, so that gets me pretty jazzed. And like, if you were, you know, offering some some advice to somebody who is uh might be mid career or even before mid career writer who's just like trying to get some to a toehold or traction into some form of freelancing or anything how would you advise that person to maybe if they want to start writing for magazines regional or national like how would you go about saying like oh these are sort of some sequential logical steps to at least get you into the game um you know, that, that old butt and seat thing is just, you, you have to ask somebody every day and have an idea every day about something that you want to write. You know, I'm teaching right now, and it's astounding to me how that idea of having an idea about something that you want to write about seems to be so elusive to college students. Mm -hmm. It's like... I don't know. I don't know what I want to. I don't know. I don't think anything. I don't have any questions. I'm not interested in anything, basically, is what some of them tell me. And I'm like, wow. Oof. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Surely there's something that you're interested in. But you have to write. I think you have to, I think you have to write every day and you have to ask every day. Yeah, that's a great point. It's yeah, it's a matter of 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 defining what rigor is and having some of that rigor, putting your butt in the chair, yeah. doing some writing, even if it is um, just journaling or something and asking some questions, asking, just try to find out where your curiosity lies and then, yep. and then just start doing some stuff. Uh, ha, what, uh, ha, how have you been able to address the, the, the student that says like, Oh, I don't have any questions. Like, like how do you, how do you connect to that person and say like, find an interest and then get them asking questions. Because if you're going to be in any kind of true, true storytelling, you can't just be navel gazing. You do have to go out and, and talk to people and ask questions. So how do you, how do you connect to that person? That's interesting because uh, the thing that they're really the worst at is navel gazing. I want you to tell them a question and then they'll just go out and find out what the answer is. They don't want to have to think about it. They think they can just go look it up. But they usually are interested in something. They just don't think it's a – they somehow don't think it's an appropriate topic for college maybe or the particular class that they're in. And, and usually if I, if I have a, a long enough conversation with them, like 15 or 20 minutes, I can help them find something. But they're, they're kind of bad at navel-gazing. Um, I, I just recently had, had spent an entire class talking about – the difference between writing a college essay and writing something that's reflective. Hmm. And, you know, and some of them just like can't get that. Hmm. So what kind of writing or reading do you assign them to show them like, okay, this is, this is how it's done. Like these right. are some models for you. Here's my really big hint of the day. And then <laughs> go look at the stuff that other gophers are writing because I can make a personal connection between a book that Meredith May has just done and my class. So Meredith May 
did the I Who Did Not Die book just a few months ago. In fact, it was hard to get it on the bookstore. So I put her book on as a as a book that we had to read in my class. And then my class got to ask her questions about what, you know, about writing this book with these two guys that she wrote it about, um, you know, all they had all, they had a lot of really good questions because they were thinking about that personal because they had read this book and then they got to ask the person who wrote it questions about how they did it. So that 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 was big. That was really big. That that kind of cut through the crap, as it were. Yeah, because it, um, it puts a face so, to the work, and it makes it a little more accessible in yeah. a sense. Well, and it's a brand new book too. That's the other thing. And I had the luxury of, um, you know, really picking super um, contemporary stuff. So I'm not in a position of having to teach class like my husband's teaching right now, which is British Renaissance literature. <laughs> Whoa, that is that's es- <laughs> that's esoteric. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. You know, um, I will I'll definitely do that again. I've got um, I'm teaching a creative writing class next semester and I'm thinking about, um, you know, I haven't seen the unity anthology that cats put together yet. But, you know, I might do that. I might use that book in the in the class and then my students come back and talk to cat about it. And I think kind of what you're saying here underscores a really important point about. Uh, building a network, but organically building it and be having patience for it to sort of grow over time. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got, you know, having the probably the like the big thing coming out of any MFA program is if you do it right, you have you make a lot of friends. And that's probably the takeaway, ultimate takeaway in a lot of ways. And yeah, yeah. it's a huge resource. It's a huge resource. And that's like if you're freelancing or teaching or anything. You know, it's a way to get at not feeling jealous about somebody else's success because you like you bring everybody you bring as many people as you can with you. How have you been able to cultivate that that feeling is that writers? It's just kind of natural, I think, among all artists to look over your shoulder and see how so and so is doing and maybe maybe look behind you and say, like, wow, there's someone who's. 20 years younger than me, who's, who, in my estimation, is farther up the ladder than I am, and what am I doing wrong? It's like, how have you been able to cultivate yeah. that over your career? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of it is that, you know, the, the teachers that we had at Goucher were extraordinarily generous with their own process and work. And I think, you know, that, uh, that goes out into the world with all the students. Um, and there are several people that I've kept in really close touch with, even though I've been gone since 2005. Um, always thinking about people when I'm doing an anthology. So all my anthologies have had some gopher in there somewhere. Um, and um, I, I'm in, really involved with a literary festival. The, we actually have a literary festival in my little, little town, little county. And, um, you know, I, wherever I can, I try to get Goucher people, uh, involved in that. Like Phil Gerard's been a couple times to our festival now and, and, and he, people like that. So it, it, it's a community that can be excited for one another that way. Um, so, you know, man, I'm happy to have people along. There's, there's a couple Goucher people in the baseball book who've not been published before. Oh, wow. That's big for them. Right? So yeah. it's huge for them. It's huge. Um, and I think, you know, they're going to remember, they're going to remember that the next time they're working on something that they need, they need somebody else in or some other help with. Kat Pleska's done that several times as well. And the other thing is with my, the publisher that I have, since they're so close and they like me mostly because I, I try to get out there and sell books, <laughs> which everybody doesn't do apparently. So what are maybe three to five 
books that you've returned to over and over again as kind of a guiding compass that reminds you how it's done and kind of inspires your own work? Mm, you know, I find that changes all the time. Huh. Um, I, I, maybe it's because I'm a freak and I read a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, and I read a lot of really, I mean, I read all kinds of things. Like I read a lot of crime fiction. <laughs> yeah. And that's partly the fault of some of my Goucher um, friends that I was in school with that were pointing me towards people, but that they thought were really fine writers, even though they might have been considered less than literary in their subject matter. Um, like a James Lee Burke, but mm -hmm. I, um, I really, really like to read new things and then I don't end up going back to them for like 10 years. There's a book, um, right now that I, that I've read like three times already. And it's not that old. It's just a few years old. It's called a leaf, the unseen. And it's by this woman named, uh, Willow Wilson who is actually a uh, comic book writer. But this is a novel that she wrote like three, four years ago. And it's this great combination of, of uh, post-apocryphal, but not really sci-fi, computer, religion, and genies. So somehow she talks about all of those things. Hmm. And, uh but on the other hand, I, I, you know, my, my bird by bird book is like, just beat the crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, uh, the bird by bird, great example. What other, um, what books on writing have you really connected to over the years? I like Philip Gerard's book about writing nonfiction that matters. I find that, to, that one to be very helpful. Um, the the new McPhee book is really good, and I can see that that's going to be hanging around for a while. Yeah. Well, I think those are the those are the hard those are the hardcores right now. I did just order a new copy of the Chicago Manual of Style. I find that I'm grossly out of date with my edition. I think the newest one is like 17 or 18, and I had like 13. Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't very helpful with um, with editing anymore because those things, especially with all the electronic citation rules and stuff, change so quickly. With the with the McPhee book, a uh, big takeaway that I that I, I took away from from that was a, a sort of eschewing a thesaurus for just a dictionary for finding another word, like looking up the word that I'm trying to replace looking up its definition and then using a word in the definition as a replacement. And, uh, which I thought was just a really cool, a cool way to just be more connected to an actual dictionary. Um, it is. Yeah. And, uh, are there any other, are there little things like that that you employ in your writing routine or editing routine that, uh, that you've, you know, just, you just have it in your tool belt. Um, my um, – when I was getting my MA, I had this thing happen to me where I, I, I won a prize for a paper, and the, and the program director, she called me up and she said, I have good news and bad news. And I said, really? She said, well, you won the prize. And I'm like, that's the good news, right? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, what's the bad news? And she said, I'm going to edit it. <laughs> and she had a – she actually made a key – with different color highlighters to edit that paper. So I, and I, you know, hopefully have improved since then and don't need as many colors as she did use, but I do do that. And I'll go through a piece that I have and I'll, I'll highlight every passive voice use in one color or an indirect pronoun reference in another color. Or even just in the baseball book, how many times did you use the word baseball mm -hmm. in the piece? Um, or, you know, it, depending on what the subject matter is, I might have to go through and do that. Um, and I'll, I'll sometimes I'll go through and use and use a color for all the adverbs and see if they really need to be there at all. 
Yeah, that's a good yeah. tip. What did that do to your confidence to you, you wrote this piece that you're like, yeah, this is great. And you won even better. And then all of a sudden you just see it like torn to shreds. Like, <laughs> so what, it was kind of sad, <laughs> but, but I won, I won some money for that. So it may, it, I felt a lot better and it, and it did actually get published. Um, and you know, I felt bad when I was editing it with her. But after I, it got published, I thought, well, this is really cool because now it's not a POS anymore. I mean, I don't have to worry about <laughs> somebody else doing that to it in print, you know. So it was a big favor. I do still have that paper and, you know, all the corrections and the keys and everything. It's like sitting out in a folder, easily accessible. So if I'm feeling like, Ugh, this isn't if there's a reason that I feel like something's not coming together, I can go back and look at that and, and remember I'm probably doing one of those things she pointed out all those you know 20 some years ago. Wow, wow. And it's usually true too. I mean I can go, oh yeah, that's what I'm doing again that's messing this piece up. So how do you start your day? So you feel like you're going to be productive, get a lot of words on the page or have a good teaching day. Like what's your morning routine, your first hour to two hours of the day to like really warm up? I'm in the car on teaching days for a couple hours with my husband. And, you know, sometimes we talk, but sometimes we listen to a book on tape. And I'm so I'm really big on books on tape. And they're almost always like um, they're always nonfiction. They're always usually history or something like I'm listening right now to the new, um, the Gordon S Wood, uh, book about Adams and Jefferson that just came out. So I got words going in my head right away, <laughs> one way or another on the days that I'm not in the car. First thing I, sp I spend the first couple hours in the op in my office, in my house. Um, and it may not be, writing on a particular piece or working on the novel. Um, but I'm, I'm writing something. And do you have an evening routine too? I don't. And, and, you know, and that started really when I was doing graduate school stuff, because the first time I went to graduate school, I had two teenagers in the house oh. and a full-time job. Right. So when do you do that? Right. You get up at four or five in the morning and do it before there's anybody awake asking you for shit. <laughs> right? And then you go to work. And I and that's what I did at Goucher too. I would get up early in the morning and didn't have kids in the house anymore, but I had a full time job. So I'd get up at four or five and spend two or three hours on whatever I needed to be doing. And then I went to work at eight or nine. And when I came home from work, I didn't do anything. No, no, I did no work on, you know, writing. And I would take one Saturday or one Sunday and work from like six in the morning to noon, six hours. And then the seventh day, I didn't do anything at all. So you get like 15 or 20 hours a week in on what you're doing without, you know, going insane yeah yeah what did hard work in terms of writing look like to you it's kind of hard um, to define and and knowledge like knowledge working as cal new the author cal newport might say you know sometimes you know if you're out there landscaping it's or something it's easy to say when the grass is cut and when the bushes are pruned like and you, you know you're sweating at the end of the day like oh yeah that felt like hard work but in, uh, in in the arts, it can be sometimes hard to define. So I wonder how you define it. Yeah, it's hard because you, you, you get kind of forced into the word count or the page count as a measure. And, you know, it's not always – that's not always good. I mean, some days a lot comes out and some days not a lot comes out. So you kind of have to learn to look at bigger chunks of time, I think. So – if you can look back at over a month and what you've accomplished or what you've written and you can feel good about it, I, I think that's probably a better way to look at it. Though, you know, it's back to the old butt in the seat every day thing. 
How do you track that so that when you do look back on the month, you can actually kind of see like, oh, yeah, I didn't just squirrel away time, even though I was, even though the butt is in the chair, you know, you, you can look yeah. back on the month and be like, oh, yes, I, I did get some construction I got done. something done. You know, I think my the, right now the biggest help I have with that is that small writing group that I have um, because we meet a couple times a month. And and I just am loath, as are my other two compatriots, to not have something to bring to the group. So that's kind of like a it's 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 back to that kind of setting deadlines thing. That really works for me. Right. So I know I have to bring something because if I don't, I'm just, no, it's horrible. Yeah. And how do you deal with uh, rejections and that self-doubt that comes in with, that comes with the territory of this kind of work? Yeah. I, you know, the truth is, and this is, a, this kind of advice is easier to give when you're 61 years old because I give less of a crap than I mm -hmm. used. That's the truth. And, and, you know, and having something in print is a huge, you know, comp, you know, boost to your confidence. So it's, you know, getting older and saying, yeah, yes, yeah, so what? And, <laughs> you know, actually having something that you can look at that's in print that's got your name on it, it's big. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm really, um, I'm really thrilled for the people that are in the baseball book, um, as I was for the other couple that I did like this, that, that this is their first time being in print. I think it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. Does it feel good for you at this point? You've had you know several publishing credits and the anthologies. And at this point, does it feel good to be able to give somebody else that first publishing cred that puts gas in their tank? Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. Yes. That's that's the that's my favorite part of being an editor. And with this book, too, especially, I'm really proud of what I put in the book as well. So it's like double cool. Awesome. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. Well, Chris, this was uh, wonderful to finally get to talk to you about this. And actually, the first time we've ever been able to speak. So this was really nice. And thank you for. <laughs> so great. Yeah, and thanks thanks for letting me be a part of the book. It's a wonderful collection. I, I love just kind of picking it up when I'm in the mood to just read a little something and uh and it'd be like, Oh yeah, that's that's pretty fun. And uh, so it's kind of a cool cool reference to it's like flipping the channels through through your books. You know, you yeah. can just kinda of, all right, I'm kind of in the mood for a little ball, you know, all right, in twenty minutes I'm gonna feel a bit more enriched. So yeah. I I really yeah. So anyway, great, great work with the, with the book and continued success with it. And, um, and thanks for coming on the podcast. We'll really appreciate it. Thanks, Brennan, for being a part of it. Appreciate it. You got it. Take care, Chris. That was great. Big thanks to Chris for coming on the show. Now, I did tease something at the top of the show, and I want to follow through on that. If you leave a review on iTunes for the podcast... I will give you an hour of editing on any piece of writing you're doing. This will entail a little bit of me getting to know you and your goals, and I'll offer what I think can be done to strengthen your work. So, how do you do this? One, write your review. Two, when it posts to the iTunes page of the podcast, take a screenshot or find a way to copy it and email it to me. I already know the ones that are already posted, so if you're game is to copy one of those and pawn it off as your own, I'll know and come on, don't be that guy. Three, I'll reply and get you in the queue. As my thanks to you for taking the time to help sort of validate the podcast with your nice review. It's the currency of validation for the podcast. So if you can do that, I will offer some complimentary editing. Of course, you can always leave a review just because you're feeling nice. Subscribe if you haven't, leave a review, share with a friend, and yes, I even have a monthly newsletter over at brendanomera.com where I give out a list of book recommendations and what you might have missed from the podcast. Once a month, no spam, can't beat it. And lastly, trying yet again to get my wife to subscribe to the podcast, we got to do a shouting match. 
It seemed unfair and downright mean not to help me out, right? What could I do? Get a shower before somebody gets hurt. (laughs) Okay. You probably want to get on with your day. Thanks so much for listening. Let's do it again next week right here. Have a CNF and good week. Brendan, out.